Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the program. And on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a movie from 1965 that is often referred to as one of the worst movies ever made. But does it deserve all the hate that it gets? The answer, in my opinion, is no. It deserves more. I hate this movie. I can't stand this thing. I despise this movie for so many reasons. I've got a lot of anger directed towards this movie, and I'm going to try and vent it all throughout this video, but I don't know if that's possible. And it all starts with the poster. Look at this garbage. And it says, the picture that comes complete with a 10 foot tall monster to give you the whimwhams. What are the whimwhams, you might ask? I don't know, they couldn't even spell it right. I found a definition under whimwhams that says they are also known as the jitters. Well, what are the jitters? The dictionary says a sense of panic or extreme nervousness. Look, I'm already jumping through hoops just to try and figure out what this bogus claim the movie is trying to make about itself even means. And I say that because this is a total lie. At no point is there a sense of panic or nervousness at all. There's a sense of frustration, confusion, and extreme boredom because of how much of a mess this is, that's true. What else does it say here? An astronaut went up, uh, guess what, came down. Well, gee, I'm probably going to guess that a monster came down. I'll let you figure out for yourself how I came to that conclusion. Anyways, the movie starts with what looks like an astronaut walking on space. So apparently they launched a capsule into space to observe a UFO that was in Earth's orbit and they lost contact with the capsule for a few days. And then I guess the search team found the space capsule in a field, so they check it out and report back to Colonel Steve Connors. Now, I don't know what they did here, but this audio sounds horrible. And it's like this throughout the movie, whenever it's dialogue in this location specifically, this field. In this scene, it sounds like they recorded the ADR in a metal hallway. This is Captain Connors calling Control 2. Connor's calling patrol too. Jim, do you read me? And there's a scene in this location later in the movie that sounds even worse. But instead of dubbing this over, it sounds like they used the audio they recorded on location. I want to say that this location was either near a busy road or somewhere where there was a lot of noise. So they tried to, in post-production, isolate the sound of their voices, but you know, I'm not exactly sure. Just take a listen to this. What happened, General? Just like the others, he's all shriveled up. You are certain, Miss Logan? Yes. Oh, yes. no. Any trace of Frank? No, but we found this. The more I listen to it, it sounds like they did something to the original audio, tweaked it somehow. So they drive out to the spot to find out what happened. They find the space capsule, and I mean, Holy crap, I knew these things were small, but this is ridiculous. Look at the size of it compared to this guy. And he's bending over here. Without question, this was the capsule that had put Douglas into orbit. So you mean to tell me that someone in a spacesuit was not only able to fit into this thing, but sat there for days on end recording observations of a UFO? And to make it even worse, I'm just going to tell you right now, the person that plays the astronaut is seven and a half feet tall. There's no way he's fitting into this thing. Anyways, it looks like the astronaut, Frank Douglas, has disappeared. So these two people from, I don't know, the movie is never clear on this. I don't know who they actually work for. They go over to see Frank's sister or sister-in-law. Again, I'm not sure, but it doesn't matter. Ruth, and tell her the bad news. It's about Frank, isn't it? Ruth, the capsule came back. What about Frank? I don't know. He had all the emergency equipment he needed, but the shot was a success. The capsule did come back. Yeah, Ruth, don't you see the positive side to all of this? I mean, sure, Frank is missing, and we have no idea what happened to him. And we also don't know if the radiation repellent actually worked. So there is a chance he died a horrible, slow death. But the capsule came back. Do you not care about the capsule, Ruth? You know, I'm beginning to think that you don't, and I find that pretty hurtful. I mean, a lot of people worked on that capsule. Oh, Ruth, honey, just try not to even think about it right now. What am I going to tell Jimmy? You can tell him that the capsule came back. That's at least something. 
I mean, Jesus Christ, do I have to walk you through this? So then Jimmy comes home and they basically have to dodge the subject with him. When's Uncle Frank coming home? Well, honey, he won't be back for a while yet. Remember, he went on a long trip. He promised to take me fishing. Well, Jimmy, if it makes you feel any better, the capsule came back. All right, you know what? I'm beginning to feel that nobody here appreciates the capsule, except me. So then the phone rings, and you gotta remember, this is back when phones sounded like they could shake the entire foundation of a house. I remember my grandparents' phone. It was like, no matter where you were in the house, that thing went off. And it was like instant anxiety attack. Like, what the hell is going on? What is that? I assume it's because back then, you know, you didn't have a phone in every room. So you had the one phone and, you know, that had to be loud enough to make sure that half the neighborhood knew that someone was calling. Anyways, they found a body. So they all go out there to check and see if it's Frank. But it's not. It's the body of the helicopter pilot. He shriveled up like a dry prune. Okay, you know what? shriveled up like a dried prune. Isn't that a bit much? Maybe he's just middle-aged. Not all of us can have perfect skin, you know. This just seems like insulting the dead. Carl says he's burned all over. Again, this doesn't look that bad, but whatever. What do you make of this, Carl? They look like severe burns. What could have caused such burns? I don't know. Probably some kid's prank. Yeah, you know how kids are running around pranking people by burning small patches of grass in an open field. Ah, those rapscallions! So back at the lab, they find that the pilot was literally cooked to death, but it wasn't from radiation. It was something else. By the way, the audio in this scene is atrocious. It's really hard to hear what they're saying most of the time. I kept thinking about the body. Wondering about the castle. Theorizing. I'm trying to find an answer. But we both know that it open when it passed over our radio signal. Now, even if I go along with you on the assumption that, that Douglas is back. Anyways, they call in Dr. Chris Manning to take a look at this case. Meanwhile, a group of 20-somethings are getting crazy. So crazy that this young lady's boyfriend has had enough of all of this. So after one last shot, he's like, all right, it's time to go. I'm drunk enough to drive now. So they park and start to make out. But there's this dog in the background, and it just doesn't stop barking. And I'm sorry, if it was me in this situation, I just wouldn't be able to perform. There are certain things that I can ignore during a makeout session. Uh, cats construction tools, fire alarms, but a dog barking, that's just impossible. There's just too many questions. Like, is it nearby? What kind of a dog is it? Can I play with it? And it looks like she was thinking the same thing because she gets out of the car and holy crap, look at this guy. So she screams and then it just cuts instantly to a dead body. But it's a good thing Dr. Manning is there to crack the case. But it's then that they suddenly hear Something that would distract any man from the task at hand. What was that? Yeah, I heard that too. You guys go ahead and check over there. I'm gonna go ahead and get this ready. So they find the girl passed out and decide to take her back to the lab. I guess don't bother having someone stay behind and further inspect the crime scene for clues. Dr. Logan decides to bring his Geiger counter out to the landing site to see what he can find and oh my god look, it's a single stick of wood that's been burned somehow. Better file this under totally rare and suspicious. So he starts going deeper into the bush, which is very risky, and I think we all know why. Because that's how you end up with burrs. I hate burrs. I've hated burrs since I was a kid. Hate them even more now. It seems like their only purpose is to just destroy fabric. You go out someplace and you get burrs on some fleece or like a wool hat, you might as well just burn it as far as I'm concerned. Anyways, he's in there searching for what could have burned that stick when suddenly, out of nowhere it seems, he's choked by Frank Douglas. It's amazing that at no point could he see the seven and a half foot tall man walking around. Would you like to dance? No. 
See, now this is a bold move, asking a girl to dance when there's no music playing. Because she might see it as a, you know, nice, sweet, fun gesture. But you also run the risk of her starting to think that one of you is crazy. Either you're crazy for hearing the music, or she's crazy for not hearing the music. Just the timeless art of seduction. I've got the most peculiar feeling that something's terribly wrong. Ever since Frank was lost. Yeah, I don't know if that's that peculiar of a feeling. I mean, the guy was shot into space, all communication was lost, then the capsule came back down to Earth and he's nowhere to be found. I think it's pretty obvious that something is terribly wrong. I mean, it's not like they're just gonna suddenly find him hanging out at an Applebee's like, oh yeah, you know, it was a long trip, I just wanted to grab a bite to eat as soon as I got back. Anyways, they get to the site where they found the body of Dr. Logan. And they're like, holy crap, look at his twisted face. I suppose again, there wasn't anybody around who saw anything. No, but may I suggest that this is actually a case of autoerotic asphyxiation? I mean, just look at his face. Does it not look like he died mid-orgasm and just froze that way? I mean, maybe you don't make that exact face, but actually, how would you know? H how would you know? Have you ever seen your own O face, right? The only way to really find that out is if you had maybe your spouse hold up a mirror at the exact moment of climax. And that would be weird, you know, because I think for a split second, it might feel like you're having sex with yourself. Hey, after I'm done taking pictures of the dead body, could I get a shot with all of us? You know, because I mean, how, how often do we all get together like this? Anyways, Chris is like, you better take me into town so I can see what Dr. Logan was on his way to get. But that just never happens. And then this guy shows up on a plane, Dr. Brent. And then he says that Chris turned the case over to him. Oh, okay, well, that just came out of nowhere. But there's a reason for it, and I'll explain what happened at the end of this video. So Dr. Brent meets with Dr. Kramer. Again, I have no idea who all these people work for, quite honestly, but it looks like the doctors have determined that they are, in fact, looking for a monster. That's the scientific term. The monster. It's true. We have a radioactive something or other, 10 foot tall, 400 pounds. Yes, so they know it's a radioactive monster, 10 feet tall, 400 pounds, and this is all based off of absolutely nothing. I mean, no one has seen anything. There's no physical evidence that supports these numbers. So this would be what's known in the scientific community as bullshit. So Dr. Brent wants to see Dr. Logan's log. And here's where we get some captivating action. Isn't this exciting? So Dr. Brent wants to see Dr. Logan to talk about the discrepancies he's found in these two logs. Where's Dr. Logan? He's either in the commissary or perhaps he's back in the other laboratory. I'm sorry, what? He died. You might be confused right now, but don't feel bad. Again, I'll explain why at the end of this video. Okay, so Brent meets with this guy who is supposed to be Dr. Logan. There's a line of dialogue that explains this is actually his brother because that's not confusing at all. I hate this movie so much. Anyways, Dr. Logan says that he injected Frank Douglas with a serum that protects against radiation and that he injected him with a double dose as added protection. So of course, Dr. Brent asks what happened when he injected animals with this serum. I put it back in the cage with the other pigs. Killed every one of them it touched. It grew twice its normal size. Wow, that's some incredible work, Dr. Logan. I mean, you injected a pig with this stuff the pig turned into a violent mutant, and you thought, yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine with a human. I mean, <laughs> testing is really just a formality anyways. Dr. Logan did know where the giant was, in a storeroom in that very building. What? So he had the monster locked up in the basement. 
When did this happen? How did this happen? There's no explanation. It's just, yeah, they got the monster and in order to fight the side effects of the antidote, they have to inject it with enough tranquilizer for 10 men every single day. And now I have absolutely no idea what's going on here. He leaves to go give the monster the tranquilizer and by the time he gets back, the monster escaped got upstairs, destroyed everything in the office that could be used to make the antidote? Like, what? How does this make any sense? How is that even possible? Now, you may be thinking, if this guy managed to lock up the monster, why didn't he tell anyone? And that's a good question, but the movie does provide an answer. Why didn't you tell us then? I don't know. What the hell do you want from me, Dr. Brent? I don't have a precision mind like yours. Yeah, it turns out he's just an idiot. He's smart enough to work in a lab, conduct all these experiments, log the results, but he just doesn't have a mind of such precision to tell anyone when he captures the monster they're all looking for. So Colonel Connors gets a call from someone who tells him exactly where the monster was spotted. And let's just go back for a second. I want you to listen to this because it sounds like the phone didn't actually ring. It sounds like someone just made the sound effect of the phone ringing with their mouth. Like it literally sounds like someone was standing there just going Brr. Okay, so now we have a scene that brings the stupidity of this movie to a new level. I'm gonna try and break this down for you the best that I can. So the Colonel goes to Einstein here and he's like, hey, Washington called and they put me in charge of this thing so I need answers. What's really going on with Frank Douglas? And Logan is like, um, well, I have a theory that he's getting worse because the first time I injected him with the antidote, it lasted for five days. Which makes you wonder, how long did this guy have the monster locked up without telling anybody? Then he says that with every subsequent injection, the antidote wore off faster, and the last injection only lasted a few hours. No, he doesn't get larger. The radius of his danger zone does. Okay, so I guess the danger zone is the radiation coming off of him and he's becoming more radioactive by the second. And you had this guy locked up in a cage inside of that building for how long without telling anybody? This guy is the dumbest character in this movie. He's got to be destroyed. And the army was called out in force because this was, after all, an American astronaut. Official orders were not to fire. So this guy is growing bigger and more radioactive by the second, He's going around killing people. The colonel says he needs to be destroyed, but don't shoot him, he's an astronaut. You know what, I take it all back. The colonel is the dumbest character in this movie. The monster is moving towards Ruth's house, so they deploy some guards, but Jimmy is like, screw this, I'm going outside. Let me go! My dog, look! Okay, so judging by this shot, the monster is what? 15, 20 feet tall at this point? Okay, fine, that should make for an interesting climax to this movie. Now, all of the soldiers are just um, randomly shooting into the dark. Wow, talk about an action-packed scene. Too bad we can't see any of it. So I guess shooting the monster does nothing. The colonel says it's like shooting a wall. Now what, doctor? I don't know. There's that line again. How long would it take to mix up 3,000 cc of the antidote? Not too long. Not that long? I thought the monster destroyed everything you needed to make the antidote. And now it's like, oh yeah, I can whip up a batch of that. <laughs> Whatever, they mix up the antidote and get ready to shoot it into the monster with a tranquilizer gun. So they get all this crap set up to try and pinpoint the location of the monster. Oh boy, I can't wait to see how this concludes. I'm serious, I want this to be over so bad. Holy crap, he's coming down some steps. Here we go, guys. Shit is about to go down right in the middle of Chicago. You got all this footage of emergency vehicles and whatnot, and it turns out he's in the sewer. So they get all fitted up with radiation suits, and this takes a while, but whatever. I'm sure it will all be worth it. But by the time they finally get down there and walk around for a bit, we get this. As if a switch had been turned. 
Suddenly, there was no trail, no monster. There was nothing in the tunnel but the puzzled men of courage who suddenly found themselves alone with shadows and darkness. That's right, nothing. Turns out Frank Douglas was already rescued, as revealed by this telegram. I really don't think I've seen a movie that's pissed me off more than this. This is just a complete slap in the face. I mean, you followed along with this stupid story for an hour and eight minutes, and in the end, the movie just turns to you and goes, Hey, I don't know. Well, I don't know either. That's why I'm watching the movie. You tell me what happens. Then who or what has landed here? Is it here yet? Is the menace with us? Or is the monster gone? You don't get to end this movie with a question mark. No, 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 I'm sorry. This ain't that movie. This isn't some chilling mystery. This isn't some thought-provoking conclusion that serves as a poignant reflection of the world we live in. This isn't the French connection. So I guess the whole time it was an alien who eventually went down into the sewer and disappeared. Kind of like this movie. I hate this movie. I genuinely hate it. It's easily in my top three most hated movies of all time. So this movie was directed by Bill Rabane, who after this movie did a bunch of low budget films in the 70s and 80s. There's actually a Blu-ray collection of some of his films. Now he ran out of money while he was making this movie. So another filmmaker, Herschel Gordon Lewis, bought the film, but he didn't finish it until years later. So because of that, you get a production that was all out of sorts. So what you get is a movie that feels completely disjointed and really hard to follow at points. There's characters who suddenly disappear like Chris. The guy who played Dr. Logan's brother was actually the same guy who played Dr. Logan, but by the time they shot the new scenes, he looked different. And the story had killed Dr. Logan, so they just decided to write him in as the brother. In the end, it's a total mess that has a terrible conclusion, but that's pretty much it for this picture. As usual, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you all next time. Hey, after I'm done taking pictures of the dead body, can I get a shot with all of us? You know, because I mean, how, how often do we all get together like this? Oh, okay, I guess that's a no. Yeah, everybody's just gonna leave, that's nice. Okay, whatever, fine, I guess it's just gonna be me and uh, this guy here. Oh my god, I'm gonna have to do this. Did you ever have that in school? Like, when a teacher was like, you know, handing out papers or whatever? I had this French teacher, she would just like gob her fingers with spit. Like, she's like, ah, tch, 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 tch. and you just sat there praying that you weren't the person in line to get the first gobbed page. <laughs> <laughs> I vividly remember one time she got to my desk and just, uh, and I was like, oh God, no. And my page just had, it was visibly wet. <laughs> so they check it out and report back to Colonel Steve Connors. So they check it out and report back to Colonel Steve Connors. It's going to be so hard for me to say that without slipping up and saying Colonel Steve Sanders. Mm -hmm.